Folks, this has to be said, and it's true because it's true. The enemy is already within our gates. While talking about the things happening in the world and the prophecies that are occurring in the world, we cannot neglect the things that are happening in our church. Grows apostasy. That's what we're going to be talking in this presentation. Let's see you after the intro. Folks, cordial welcome once again to another presentation with Lighthouse Beams Ministry. In this video, we'll be talking about apostasy in our midst, amongst our ranks, in our church. Now, friends, some, some people will be, some people are very skeptical about talking anything, think, saying things to the conference. You know what? There is gross apostasy in our very own church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Um, if we leave it just like this, who's going to fix it? Some people say it's low daisy. It's supposed to be like that. Yeah, but there has to be a refi revival, reformation from amongst ourselves. The spirit of prophecy says, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the world. Stupidity, like lethargy, seemed to hang upon the minds of all who profess to believe that we were having the last message. Cried out, my angel, accompanying angel, cried out with awful solemnity. Get ready, get ready, get ready. There's to be a special walk for the people of God right before he comes back again. But who's going to call out that reformation? The spirit of John the Baptist. Let me just say this before I start. The people, many times we trust in those the pastors and people connected to the conference. But frankly, frankly, I believe that the people in the conference cannot do these things. Why? Because they are connected with the system that it is hard for them to come out and call those heresies out. It's very difficult for them. God has to choose people outside the conference to come and point out these things. And I believe I'm one of those people trying to, to bring these truths to light so that we can fix it in our church. After all, my burden is not to divide and destroy the church. Because if, if we leave things to take its own course, I tell you, heresy will divide us from our midst. But it's good before the heresies come in and destroy us. Truth also is presented at the same time. Now look at what Spirit of Prophecy says in last day events, page 156, paragraph 2. It says, we have far more to fear from within than from without. Is there anything, the first question, is there anything to fear from within? Is there problems from within? According to this statement, yes, there is. We have far, And, and th those are the problems that we have far more to fear. From within than from without. The hindrance to strength, the hindrance to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. You see, the things that are happening in the world, as long as we are united, we can go uh, face it head on. But when it's from amongst ourselves, it's what we call divide and destroy. Spoiling, corroding from within, internal corruption. That's what we're going to be talking about in, in this presentation. Now, first Bible text, let, let me just throw some Bible text out there. A Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they are, they be agreed? Now, we're going to be talking about us mingling with the world, ecumenism, so-called ecumenism. Why should we be participating in those things and what should be the spirit if so, if we are to participate? We'll try to analyze what the conference is saying and what the Bible says. Now, while you may be thinking, why are we talking about these things? Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 actually admonishes us that only those people who shy and cry are the people who will be receiving the seal of God. And pause, let me just say this. If you don't open your mouth to talk, the spirit of Babylon will hook you like a trap and it, you will be caught up in it that you think that it is normal. The more you keep talking, the more you fight for it wherever you are in your own local churches, um, wherever you see it trying to arise, you're trying to prevent, you blocking, you putting a barricade around your own mind so that you are not tainted by those gross apostasy that are creeping in. Now look at this. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. That is where. Where is that? In Jerusalem. There were abominations in Jerusalem. Amongst God's people, God said, Go through the city, 
put my mark upon those people that sigh and cry. You know, Spirit of the Prophecy actually says that we should read Ezekiel chapter 9. A lot of times he mentioned this because this is the process by which we're going to be judged, by which the sealing will be taking place. And if that is so, we have to call out those uh, apostasy, those heresies amongst from amongst our own ranks. So, look at this. Um, seven, volume 7 of Testimonies, page 138, paragraph 2 says, Seventh-day Adventists had been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. Friends, friends, while we are in this world, we are not of the world. We are peculiarly called out. We call it the remnant. And the remnant is not the same as others. We are the last remaining, I believe, that we will be the last remaining Protestants, last standing Protestants, while all are swept away by this flood of heresies from the enemy's ranks. But we have to understand who we are first, our own identity. We are a peculiar people. By the how, how, how are we called out? But the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the wall and has brought them into connection with himself. He has made him his representative and has called them to be his ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. That is your work and my work. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warning ever sent by God to men have been committed, committed to them to be given to the world. What are we saying here? If there's been any greater truth or solemn truth ever given by God to men, even warning, it is the warning and the message that we bear. We are not to compromise that truth. We are to stand our ground and attack the enemy. Now, I, I, I'm going to show you something, but I want to try to put the framework up first so that you know why are we talking about this thing. People trust too much the conference. Now, I'm not saying that our conference is Babylon. We have to understand this. The conference was actually ordained by God, and uh, it's supposed to be God's ambassador, just like the quotation says. But you know what? The spirit of prophecy, actually our prophet, said that in the same way that the Jew is apostated in the past and they could not be used by God, our system, our very structure have to be swept away while we approach the coming crisis right before us. There will be a shaking such as never was, and this shaking will be will, will cause the whole conference and, the, and our church to actually divide, and we will see who is really on the right side. Now, let, let's see. Maranatha page, uh, manuscript release page 379, volume 2, volume uh, 379, paragraph 2, volume 13. It says, in the word, in his word, the Lord declared that he would do for Israel if they would obey his voice. What he would do for Israel if they would obey his voice. But leaders of the people yield to the temptation of Satan and God could not give them the blessing he designed them to have because they did not obey his voice, but listen to the voice of policy, voice and policy of Lucifer. Friends, we're going to see, see some things that tries to put policy above principle. Bible and the spirit of prophecy is clear that if some principles, uh, policies are placed that are not the contradictory to the principles, biblical set principles, when principles and, and policy come in collide, come face to face, what should triumph? Policy should triumph, or principles should triumph. Now look at this. This experience will be repeated in the last year of the history of the people of God who have been established by His grace and power. Which movement is he talking about? She's talking about this movement, the Adventist Church movement. Now, this is not my words, by the way. I never call Adventist Church Babylon. We will go through and the church will go through until the crisis and the remaining faithful ones it takes to heaven. Most people will join the ranks of the opposition, say spirit of prophecy. Um, men whom he has greatly honored will, in the closing scene of this herd's issue, pertain after ancient Israel. What does that mean? They will become modern day Judases, betraying the church. That's the spirit of prophecy, friends. That's not my word. 
Take another quotation, Desire of Ages, page 36, paragraph 2. The people whom God has called to be the pillar and ground of truth have become representative for Satan. Who is he talking about? In the past to the Israelites, the Jewish nation, but now it's going to be referring to our church. They were doing the work that he described, he desired them to do, taking a cause to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The very priest who ministered in the temple had lost the significance of the uh, lost the significance of the service they performed. They had ceased to look beyond the symbol of the things signified in presenting the sacrificial offering. They were as actors in a play. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of binding the mind and harden, hardening the arts. Now, what will happen? God could not more, could do no more for men through these channels. The whole system had to be swept away. That is the actual problem that was occurring with the people of old. And remember, Spirit of Prophecy showed us that what happened then will again happen in the last day through this medium, this means, this, this organization of movement which God Himself has selected and divinely ordained. Friends, now, there is not to say that all are corrupt within the conference. There are some good people. We're going to be talking about our mission, our objective, and our, our, our message as well. Three angels' message in relation to our identity. Now, they, this, I'm going to show a video from uh, um, Pastor Mark Finley during the spring meeting, spring uh, general conference meeting, spring general conference meeting that he, he tried to address some important things while talking about the truth that we have, the message that we bear. This is what Mark, Pastor Mark Finley actually says. Take a listen. I wanted to spend a few, just a moment, um, on the relationship of message and mission. We in this house spend a great deal of time talking about the mission of the church the need to reach every nation, kindred, tongue, and people with the gospel. But that mission is fundamentally dependent upon our message. If there is an erosion of confidence in creation and a seven-day creation week, that impacts the Sabbath. If there's erosion of confidence in the, conf in the concept of the state of the dead, that impacts our preaching on the resurrection. If there is an erosion of confidence in the concept of the urgency of Christ's coming, that impacts the signs of the times. If there is an erosion of confidence in the remnant theology, God raising up a unique divine movement of destiny, that's going to impact our mission. If we look at the history of mainline denominations, particularly in North America, they started as Bible-based. But as time went on, there was this slippage, this erosion. They've lost their sense of mission. I will never forget planting a church in one of the major cities in America. And we went to rent a non-Adventist church because we had no church. And the pastor took me around and he took me under a stairwell where they had little chairs for their Sunday school. And with a sorrowful look on his face, he said, we used to be packed in this church, but we no longer are. They lost their message, so they lost their mission. We are a movement that's almost, if you look at 1844 to 2044, 200 years old. And as time goes on, we can lose that urgency, that commitment to be a Bible-based movement. I believe that this initiative, sure some refinements and discussion, can help us focus on the reason why we're here, to proclaim a unique message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. Folks, well said. I cannot reiterate what he said more perfectly than how he just mentioned, friends. Our identity our message and our mission, three things. 
our identity, our message, and our mission. We should know our identity. And together with the, the mission that we have to go reaching the world, yes, we have to go reach the world. But what is the message that we go to reach them with? What is the message that we are we going to go take to, to the people to reach them? Now, I want to diverge into something that is happening within the par, um Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Office of the General Conference. Um, our Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director from the General Conference. Guys, this person is not an Adventist. This person is actually a Judas within our midst. He's trying to sell us with He's trying to sell his denomination away. Um, look on the screen. This is the year 2016, October 12, when he first went to the Vatican City for a communal meeting at, uh, at Vatican City. The look at the title. It says, The Pope explains the ecumenism by blood. Los terroristas no hacen diferencia entre los cristianos. The terrorists don't distinguish between Christians. What he's trying to say is that we are not terrorists. We should come in unity. Doesn't matter what doctrines you have. We could, we should come together in a communism by blood. And look at the next screen. This way he actually shake the hands of the papacy, the man of sin, the antichrist. Folks, where in the Bible have we found that the Pope converted? Will he be, will he ever be converting? We are told from Jeremiah that a leopard cannot change his spot. And where in the Bible did it ever say that we're going to convert the Pope to become a Christian and there's not going to be a Sunday law? We know that this guy is never going to be changing. And why do we go there when the prophecy and the Bible explicitly tells us not to go? There is forbidden territory. There is going to negotiate with the devil, friends. Think about this logically. And this person is holding a sacred office from the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Think about it. I want to show you a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, at least we think that why, why is it uh, it's God is leading this guy? Testimonies, Volume 4, page 210, paragraph 5, it says, Satan's chief walk is at the headquarters of our faith. He spares no pain to corrupt men in responsible positions and to pursue them to be unfaithful to their several trusts. Friends, this person has betrayed God's trust. If he is an Adventist, but to me, what he's doing, he's a traitor. He's not one of us. He's one, he's one with Babylon. Again, why is he going back? Two cannot agree, two can walk together unless they be in agreement. What is Ganon Diop going to Vatican City to do? I've never seen the Bible explaining that the Pope is going to be changing from the Antichrist to a Christian. Now, look at this on the screen. <clears throat> now, we're going to let him to explain his stance. He felt the need of explaining. This is actually in the same meeting that Mark Finley was talking about. Our mission with our message, in line with our message. This is Ganon Diop, the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty a Director of the General Conference, giving his take on what he understands to be religious liberty, fighting for religious liberty. Take a listen. This presentation is purpose to simply make a case about the necessity of having public affairs and religious liberty, especially to mingle with people and make a case for who we are as Seventh-day Adventists in the public space. In one word, we are a blessing. In fact, Paul is similar to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or State Department in the political realm. Paul works to promote a good reputation for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Just as a diplomat, and I can even say the diplomat of the United States, though himself a Jew, mingles with Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, without sacrificing his Jewish identity, but representing the interests and reputation of the United States of America. Likewise, we at PAL represent our church, mingling with people of all beliefs without diluting or compromising our Seventh-day Adventist 
identity, mission, and message. Pause. Folks, uh, let, let me get, let, let's just cl cl clarify something. Jesus mingled with non-believers, uh, pagans, Edens. He mingled with them. But why did he mingle? We are told from ministry of healing that Jesus mingled as one desiring their good. And the final outcome of his mingling was a call to follow me. He said, follow me. That was the final stage of our purpose to mingle with them is to bring them to our truth. And that goes with, along with our message. Our message. Ganondi, what message have you been bringing to those people? What message have you been preaching to them? That the Pope is the Antichrist? Is that what you were telling him when you were shaking hands with him? I mean, when you go and shake hands with them, you are telling him that you are in agreement with what he does and what he says. You are in agreement with ecumenism, throwing all doctrines away and just uniting. Uniting based upon what? We are told from the Bible that we are sanctified by the truth, united by the truth. I can't imagine what was going on in that conference. Let's take a listen what he's trying to say. Now, the following presentation also is purposed to dispel misinformations and discourage the spread of disinformation accusing the GC of compromising the Adventist message. What is really at stake is the credibility of the Seventh-day Adventist church in the public space. As we speak, there is a government that has denied the church to locate a union headquarters in their country. Why? Because we were accused of being a sect. And this was based, by the way, on the assumption that in France, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was put on the list of sects. This was not true, by the way. In fact, in France, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is officially part of the French Protestant Federation. And that doesn't mean losing our identity as Seventh-day Adventist. We actively work as per preventive diplomacy and the corrective diplomacy to position our church in a favorable light before decision makers, government officials, lawmakers, legislative assemblies, and judicial entities and institutions that Seventh-day Adventists are assets to society. Now this, again, does not mean at all that we are compromising the truth in trying to please people. No. Really? We're not trying to compromise our truth. So what are you going there to do? Again, I'm asking, you sitting down, Jesus went to minister to the people. He didn't go there to be ministered by them. He didn't go to sit there so that they can give him communion service. He didn't go there so that they could preach them, preach him their false doctrines. He went to bring the light of truth to those people, folks. So what are we doing amongst them? Just passing the time? Just developing a relationship? Really? Is that what we're called to do? Wherever we go, we're supposed to evangelize, friends. Why do we have to try to take care of our rela re reputation? Call me a sect any day, friends. Call me a sect any day. As long as I'm standing on biblical principle, who comes up with those principles and say, you, you are a sect if you do this or then? This is what actually brought great division into our church in the 1950s. That's what actually caused the uh, resulted in the book, as Advent, the Adventist Questions and Doctrines, which was a divisive book in the church, which divided a lot, which caused confusion and chaos amongst our ranks, mingling with the world, worldlings, Babylon, the daughters of Babylon. Why do we have to fit them? Do they have the highest standard that we should fit into their shoes to, to be categorized as true Christians? Is that what we're doing? No, we have the truth. They should come to us so that we minister unto them. And even when we go to them, we're supposed to be the ones ministering. Friends, this guy is trying to defend our name. Bring on the persecution. Persecution is going to come. Are we going to be trying to 
brass of anything and every dog prince that we have. So, so just so that we maintain our name, I, I can't I can't wrap my mind around this, friends. This is heresy at its highest, at its peak. Now look at this. This is what our pioneers believe. Great controversy. Page 45, paragraph 3, it says, to secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession, concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased. These are the people who died for the truth. To dearly purchase at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war, friends. Bring on war. I do not defend, need to defend my name. If it means bringing on wars, bring it on. Bring it on. That's what we've been told. That's what we expected. Matthew chapter 24, verse 9. Yes, there'll be hatred of all nations. This will go only, only to an extent, only a short run. This is as far as it goes, friends. You cannot compromise truth. Truth can never be compromised. Now, if Seventh-day Adventists are perceived as hostile, slanderers, accusers of others, and highlighters of what is wrong with others, instead of focusing on what is right with us, then people will pay us back by intentionally pushing back on any request from us. It doesn't have to be like this. Civility is good and noble. However, the fruit of the Holy Spirit manifested for the benefit of others is even better. And those are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Friends, Ecumenism, that is the buzzword for ecumenism. Focus on what is common and good in them and what we have in common. Leave those things that are negative. Leave those things that contradicts that doctrine. Do not fight it. That actually started with the bringing of the new, new logo, by the way, that flame logo, which we're not going to talk about it now, but I'm just mentioning that. But what, what are we trying to prove, guys? Ganondio, if you're watering down the truth, who is going to preach the mark of the beast? Who is going to show the world who the beast is? What the mark of the beast is? If you want to stay there, you can stay like that. I'm going to preach on your behalf. And if you do not join me in time, you can join the ranks of the opposition. Friends, Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. They have been watering down the truth, by the way. Not been obedient to, sanctified through obedience to the truth. Will abandon the position, join the ranks of the opposition. The pathway has already been laid out. Friends, the pathway has already been laid out before us. So, Ganon Diop, explain why were you in those meetings. First, no person in the Department of Public Affairs and religious liberty can sign any document that would represent the voice of the church. The voice of the church is always in the official documents voted either at one of the following. One, the general conference in session. Two, the executive committee. Three, the administrative committee or, or at com. So when we mingle with other Christians as in the case of the Conference of General Secretaries of Christian World Communions, or with the Global Christian Forum, there is no common declaration to adopt, no resolution to sign or implement together. No. Each really? So you'll have to, uh, church official doctrines uh, prove that session, GZ session, XCOM and EDCOM. That is where the voice of the church is at, right? Good point. Now, let me ask you. So whose voice did you represent when you went to the Vatican City? 
Whose voice did you represent when you are present in all the World Council of Churches meeting? Whose voice did you represent when you actually went to Geneva, Switzerland, to put an end to protestinism with the Catholics and Lutheran? I'm going to show you that he did that. Whose voice do you represent when you go to those meetings? Friends, let me tell you this. One fine day they will tell us, who are these group of people trying to fight against us? Adventists? Their representative actually is with us. Those people are descendants. Get them and imprison them. That is how powerful Ganon Diop's office is. But yet he does not acknowledge and recognizes the position he's sitting on. And it's profaning the name of the Lord and the position that he's sitting in. You know what the spirit, the general spirit that pervades those ecumenical gatherings? I'm going to show you. This is from late Tony Palmer. This is what he said. And this is in a ecumenical gathering. Listen to it. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. It's yours. So... The protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe right? now we're all Catholics again. We're now all Catholics again. Let's all come together in one big ecumenical family. No more protest. The protest is over. The protest is over. That is what God do you believe. That is why he went to the Vatican. That is why he went to put an end to protestantism on behalf of the Adventist Church. Look at the screen. I'm going to show you right now. This is the Joint Catholic and Lutheran Commemoration for the Reformation. They celebrated 1,000, not 1,500 years of protestantism since Luther's uh, 95 Theses to the Doors of Württemberg. October 30, 2016, Ganon Diouf went to Switzerland, where they actually put an end to ecumenism. Amongst all the other delegates that, were, they, that went there, they, 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 they want to apologize. The Catholics and the Lutheran came together, shaking and trying to say that the protest is over. The protest is over. Whatever denomination are in accordance with us or in unity with us or uh, 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 share the same sentiments, come on in, come on and join us. Look at the people that are in the screen. Next slide. Um, Pope Francis and then all the other Lutheran delegates. And then there were also some other denomination that were in one accord with them that went to give the name to show that they are in one accord with them. What were they doing? Putting an end to protestantism. Bye-bye. There is no protest anymore. Look at the name on the further right. Pastor or Dr. Ganon Dio. Friends, a traitor amongst our meats, uh, Judas amongst our meats. Friends, this is so serious. This is so serious. Can you imagine that? Folks, this is so wrong. This cannot be done. This is the remnant church of God. Mark Finley, while you were preaching those, while you were sharing about our message, what is this guy doing? We have to talk to this person. Ted Wilson, what is this guy doing at the Vatican City? What are we doing when we see these apostasies amongst our own ranks? This person should be removed, should be long removed. But guess what? In the last election, he was elected again. Folks, in this next segment, I want to ask you a question. Was the last general conference session read? Think about it. Oh, come on, Brother Samuel. Come on, Elder Samuel. What are you talking about? You will assess for yourself. You have to assess for yourself. Let's see, what's the word rig? What does that mean? If anyone rigs an election, a job appointment, or a game, they dishonestly arrange it to, be, to get the result they wanted or to give someone a, a, an unfair advantage over the matter. Now, when the names were presented, we were talking about Ganon Diops going to the Vatican City, signing and agreeing that the protest is over. Now we're in one accord with Babylon, with the daughters of Babylon, we do not have any difference. We shouldn't talk about our differences. Let's come together. This is the guy that was actually, actually, they brought up the point to remove him from the panel, remove him from the list, uh, from his post as Paul. By the way, Paul is public affairs and religious liberty. Now, 
on the screen is the names of the directors that were appointed again. And look at the, 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 the red circle. Ganon Diop is director for GC Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, or PAL. PAL. Now, see what actually happened. This is taken from the Advent Messenger. Ganon Diop was re-elected as director of religious liberty, but not without opposition. There was actually opposition. People are seeing, some, some, some people are actually seeing those things that are happening. And this is what happened. The delegates of the 61st General Conference session re-elected Ganon Diop to continue service as public director for public affairs and religious liberty on June 7, 2022. During the first business meeting of the day, the nominating committee provided a full list of all the names department, uh, of the new department heads, which was to be voted on as a group rather than individuals. Now let's, we'll talk about why this is significant and why this caused many problems. As a result, Gunnan Diop, Diop's name was included in that list. As the name was being read before the vote, the delegates were given the opportunity to express their concern, ask questions, or even request that the list be rejected. Now, so they actually ask if the list, if you want to reject the list, it's open. But look at the actually, they created an atmosphere where people cannot be removed. Now look at the process. There was actually a person by the name of Jonathan that wanted to remove Ganon Diop, and this is what happened. There is a comment from Brother Jonathan. Please proceed. Uh, yes, I have a, uh, I guess, a parliamentary inquiry. I'd like to refer Ganon Diop back to the nominating committee. Uh, we would like to invite you, Brother Jonathan, to meet with the chairperson of the nominating committee. You can meet with Elder Lowell Cooper, where the baptistry was, and he will gladly listen to you. Thank you kindly. Uh, thank you kindly. Did you hear the shock on his voice because he did not expect that someone to object? Seems that things were planned in a way that there wouldn't be any objection. Now, this is what actually happened. They put the names together and they said, we have to accept it the way it is. And let me tell you this, there was no clarification on what they were to do and how they were to go about. That's why this guy was asking the question. He said, you have to go back to who's the person, Cole Cooper, the chairperson, of the nominating committee to talk with him. So he actually, good enough, he referred him to the chairman of the nominating committee. But what will happen? We'll see. Um, the chairman was sitting with someone who will be explaining the process of how names should be removed. Listen, take a listen. Not supposed to mention names, only the report. There are two options when a person objects to report. The first is that they may request that the chair refer it back. That's a request. The chair can either accept that or not accept it. The second is they can make a motion. If they make a motion to refer it, then that has to be second. It is non-debatable, and it's either referred back or it's not. So they were not supposed to mention name. Think about it. They were supposed to uh, go through the list and see who's, who's supposed to... What is the purpose of presenting this list if they cannot actually mention people's names? Hold our leaders to strict scrutiny so that people are rightly elected whom they feel that they uh, should be in those offices. Who should, who should be doing that? Well, guess what? Those people were actually rejected from... Uh, Jonathan was actually rejected. He was sent away. Now, how are they supposed to... This is how they're supposed to actually deal with those names. Listen to it. The process that we have been following is, and you know, and I understand people don't understand the ins and outs, is that we treated the request, the chair in his discretion asked those individuals um, to meet with the nominating committee chair to help make a determination 
about whether or not to accept that request or not, uh, because obviously the chair was not in the nominating committee. The chair is entitled to rely upon the nominating committee chair in making that determination. So apparently they, they actually have to, because the chairperson at the general conference wasn't uh, the person chairing the nominating committee. That's why uh, they have to refer those people back to the chairperson of the nominating committee. Apparently, seemingly, is the person that is in the right position to change, uh, to, to make referrals or to look into the matter again and discuss it. Well, guess what? That's not what actually happened at that time. But it was not further stated. If he rejects it, then what's supposed to be the, what's the next stage to take? Now, listen to this. Now, all of these individuals, if it is not accepted, have the right to make a motion for referral. I will point out that's a single motion. If it goes up or down, it can't be renewed. Um, and then we go from there. So that is the process we're following. It's the distinction between a request for a referral and a motion. And many of the times the comments were unclear. Unclear. Many of the times the comments were unclear. Well, of course, it's supposed to be unclear. If you tell them not to mention the name, neither the department, that's what they did, not even the department, then they're going to get general critique that is not pointed, and they're not going to be clear. What did you expect? What did you expect? So what happened? Let's read on the screen. It says, when sharing their concerns, however, the chairman of the business meeting would not allow the delegates to mention any of the people's name and the department's name. Then complicated things. How can a delegate express the op 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 opposition, the opposition to re-elect Ganon Diop if you can mention his name or the department to which he's been nominated? That's very true. This makes vetting a candidate for a position in an office nearly impossible. Why does the leadership make it difficult to express legitimate concerns by imposing rules that prevents you from speaking up? That's what they did, imposing rules that prevent people from speaking up. Look at the screen for yourself. This is what happened. This is after he went to talk to Cowell Cooper, the president, the, the chairperson of the nominating committee. Couldn't solve the problem. So he brought the situation, the, the query back to the chair of the general conference meeting. This is what happened. I'm very concerned about this panel. Um, over, the, over the years, our emphasis on religious liberty has changed substantially. We started out defending Adventists and the problems they had, and those problems went away. As those problems went away, we started to defend other minorities and their problems. As those problems went away, we now have entered into social justice issues. And now we do things such as write amicus curiae briefs on behalf of the Open Societies International, which is a George Soros organization which has nothing to do with religious liberty. And this also sets the tone uh, for the entire religious excuse me, liberty. Pa pa pardon me, Brother Jonathan. We have agreed that we will not allude to any department which would clearly identify a name. We had agreed upon that, hadn't we? And you have mentioned at least three times that you are talking about religious liberty. If we, you, we can agree to continue as long as we abide by this, Brother Jonathan. Whoa, 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 hold up. You know what I would say, the first thing, just leave my issue outside first. Whoever came up with these rules, this is unbiblical rules. I cannot voice my opinion at the very place that I'm supposed to air out my opinion and say if I want that person in office or not. You have to admit that it's supposed to be not clear. The issues are not going to be clear. They're going to be vague. They're not, they're not going to be pointed to a certain person. And guess what? He's actually, he, he didn't even talk about the position. You said, talk about it as a panel, as, as a list, as a, uh, he's, he's trying to throw, he's trying his very best to throw general statement, but yet he cannot, because he's trying to address a issue, a critical and a legitimate concern or issue that concerns the church. 
But guess what? He was rejected. Look at what happened next. I would just ask this body to think very, very carefully about the challenges that we are facing today and the challenges that divide us. And I think we need to consider very strongly the possibility of rejecting this panel, even if it's only because of one or two names on the panel, and that the nominated committee needs to go back and do its work and get us people who will respect our traditional Adventist values. We have been leaders in the world on many of these issues, and now we're not. Thank you, we have heard you. We will go now to microphone number two, oh, sorry, five. There is someone, Prince Ngandu. I think it's Brother Prince. Oops, sorry. The message just became unclear. Let's move on to the next one. What's your problem? And they simply passed on to the next query. Because they made the situation became clear that they cannot be pointed. And when the queries are not pointed, they wouldn't be clear. And when it's not clear, they wouldn't address the issue that we're supposed to address, folks. Tell me if the election process was not rigged. It was set, set in the stage for those people to accept. He actually went to call Cooper, apparently, clearly, to address the issue that was not addressed there. They couldn't do it. So he came back again to ask the chairperson of the committee, who recalled that he was coming, who recalled that he was coming the second time, yet slide it over. When he wanted to make the, the argument, the, the critique very pointed, he said, no, 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 no. Don't mention name nor position. Who came up with those rules? This is censorship within Adventists, censorship within our own ranks. Do you know how our pioneers actually conducted that general conference? Those were times when they were actually fighting for truth. They were heated debates from either side, but respectfully, because they knew that they were fighting for the gospel commission's sake, for the greater good of the church. And what is this? What is this? Explain to me what's going on here. I do not understand, friends. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. This is the spirit of censorship. And guess what? Look, what, look on the screen. The motion was place. 93%, 93.7% voted just to accept all those names. There was no scrutiny, no elding up people accountable for their past practices. How are you actually supposed to criticize a person in this kind of scenario? This is unthinkable, friends, unthinkable. You know what I've learned from my little life here on earth and my marriage life? I've learned that if there's an issue it has to be discussed. If you do not discuss within a marriage situation, if you leave things to take its own course, you're adding for the worst. When you do not like something, you have to open up, speak up your gut because you'll be living with that person for the rest of your life. I'll tell you, at sense there is a long way to go, opens his mouth and talk and fix problems. This is censorship, this is not fixing problem. This is not fixing problem. This is aggravating the problem within our ranks. And if anything, the spirit of Babylon is going to creep into the churches. And guess what? The kind of worship that they have in the churches, the kind of mentality, the worship and the singing and the way of worshiping will be coming in. It has already come in. Folks, in this next segment, we're going to be talking about dancing and singing in the church. Unbiblical, un Unlike Adventism, I do not know if the people who actually do this actually know what denomination they are in and how it was actually founded. And guess what? Spirit prophecy actually say that there will be dancing and singing and drum beat right before the close of probation. Look at on the screen. Last day events, page 159, paragraph 1 says, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, these comments were made in connection with the Holy Flesh Movement at the Indiana Camp Meeting of 1909. Further details, further details can be seen in Selected Message, Volume 2, page 31 to 39. Now, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of provision. 
Every uncool things will be demonstrated. Folks, if you do not believe that we are close to the close of probation, listen to Ellen White stating what you're supposed to accept right before the close of probation. Every uncool thing will be demonstrated. What happens? They will be shouting with drum, music, and dancing. The sense of rational being will be so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right reasonable decisions. Folks, look at Adventists. This is Beacon Light, Beacon Light Tabernacle SDA Church. Folks, is that having Adventism? I do not call that Adventism. That's club mentality. That's club music. That's club actions, dancing. The dancing of the club. And that is right in front, in the podium, where the Holy Scripture is supposed to be open. Think about it. Look at another scene from the same church. Look at the dancing, look at the dancing folks. Divine, why they are actually doing that? Myron look Evans said it best. He said, we have to stop demonizing things that we haven't seen before. <laughs> too much movement, too much movement, too much, too loud. Not church music. All those things. It's really a blessing that we're even in church. <laughs> Our church was founded on young people. 1844, that whole movement. Young people came together and said, you know what? Mm, change it up. Flip the script. That's why we're here. So I'm excited for the next generation to come. And when you see things that you haven't seen before, don't demonize it. Accept it. Appreciate it. See the goodness in it. See the God in it. And recognize that that thing may be what keeps your kid in church. No, your kid is in the wrong church. You have, you have many denominations that sing like that. Do you even know what our pioneers even started the movement? You're talking about them. They didn't just flip the script over because they did not, the Sunday churches were not reading the script right. They actually said that we will base our denomination upon present truth, pillars, the solid rock, solid foundation, the Bible. You know what they were doing? They were not dancing in the church. There was heartfelt searching of scripture. Praying for one another, searching for truth, all heartedly. And this is what pervades more than Christianity. And this is the worst case scenario which Ellen White presented, would happen right before the close of probation. But to some degree, it's happening many places around the world. In every church, the music, the hearing of drum beats, the singing. And let me tell you this if there's any music that moves your flesh, it's not the moving of the Holy Spirit. The moving of the Holy Spirit comes in music that does not move your flesh. Just remember that. Now, look at it. Where does the presence of God dwell? Leave it again, chapter 26, verse 2. Reverence my sensory. Were they reference in that video? Referencing the sensory? Psalms 46, verse 10. Be still. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the hidden. I will be exalted in the earth. When does God feel exalted? In stillness. In stillness. In adoration. In reverence. Be still and know that I am God. Uh, folks, this is a camp meeting in the United States. Uh, this happened last year. Take a look. The I Impact Conference. Take a
Folks, does it seem solemn? Reverence was there was there solemnity in that music? No, none whatsoever. Clip two. Now the spirit has caught the audience. Friends, let me explain. This is actually a Church of Christ, and a church coming into our Adventist, Adventist church to, to conduct our song service, to sing to us. Those people were actually paid to come and sing in our meeting, Impact Conference, Impact Camp in uh, NAD, North American Division. Now, are we looking for Adventist singers? Are we looking for Adventists who could sing? No. We are paying Babylon to come and give us their poison. Can you think about that? We are paying them to come and poison us and to kill us. A dying denomination we are, friends. We are trying to lose our identity. We are losing it, friends. And I feel the pain of Adventism when I talk this. Gross apostasy. And that is what happened last year. But guess what? This year, it just got worse. Now they're including speaking in tongue, even in our church. Take a listen. Oh, bless, bless your Lord. Bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh, come on, shout unto God. Come on, shout unto God. Come on, give him. The highest praise. Come on, shout out hallelujah. I need you to put your atmosphere in check and shout out hallelujah. Let the devil know you can't get in this space. You can't get in this space. This is a space of healing. This is a space for deliverance. This is a space for promotion. Anybody glad? Say yeah. Oh, I feel the presence of God. I feel God's presence. All the righteous people, come on, clap your hands. All the righteous people. I'm so glad to be here, Lord. I didn't know I was going to feel the Holy Ghost at the seven day at finish. I'm glad to be here with the seven day advantage. Ooh, I can't wait to tell my sisters. Guess where I was. <laughs> I can't wait to go back and tell the church of God in Christ. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come out here like a mad woman. Oh, you are one. Thank you for having me. Please help me honor Dr. Bird. Come on, let's honor the man of God. And that's the pastor that actually invited them to go. Friends, folks, how sad, what, what have become of the Adventist church? You know how Bible study camp was so solemn that the presence of God pervaded the place that they could sense the spirit? This is, the lady came into our church to feel the presence of God. Let me tell you, this is not the God that we serve. She brought in her spirit from her denomination to where we are to our denomination, to share, with, to impart that tainted, evil, malignant spirit to the audience. Do you see the dancing that everyone was participating in? That's what spirit of prophecy actually prophesied would take place. Guys, guys, who's going to talk about this? You expect the conference to say this? I'm sorry, they're not going to talk about these things. They're not going to talk about it. It has to be said anyhow. It has to, it has to be raised. This is truly a mad woman. She came in to destroy our church, to give us poison. And guess what? We paid them to come and give us poison. Can you imagine that? Wow. This is heresy. This is heresy. This is, this is, supposed, this is not supposed to take place. Folks, it's not supposed to take place. The spirit that moves your body is not the spirit of God. A music that moves your body is not the spirit of God. Moving with dancing to dancing, 
It's not the Spirit of God. And speaking in tongues, folks. Speaking in tongues. Gibberish. What language is that? Unknown tongue. We Adventists don't do that. Where did that come from? From Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is creeping into our churches. Look at the screen. There's an Adventist pastor practicing. And this is very black. He practiced that long time ago. I do not know how these people still maintain the name as Adventist pastor. Oh, by, by the way, this is you, the, the first time she sang and she just spoke gibberish, a little bit of gibberish. And because of the critics, they won the video. After the, the, the first week, the, that was the first week, the second week of the conference, again in the evening they put it the concert, and during the concert she was invited again, but they planned not to live stream the event. But somehow, somehow, someone was holding on to a phone, and this is the video. Look at the gibberish speaking and devil worshipping there, right there. <laughs> Folks, watch that. Is that biblical? No, ma'am, the Holy Spirit doesn't understand. Neither do I, neither do the, the people there. There is demon speaking, demon spirit speaking. Folks, it's already in our sheds. Their spirit have already caught up with us. Now we are trying to mimic their way of life. Many who do not know, those new ones that are coming in, those who are not spiritually founded, grounded and rooted in the truth, they will come because they love those things. But folks, we know better than that. We know the right way of worshipping. That is Babylonian system. But guess what? Gibberish speaking is now trying to become part of Adventism, something that we never did in the past. Take a look, take a listen. This is Barry Black speaking gibberish. I want you to meet me up front. I want you to step out where you are, come down and meet me here up front. I want to have a special prayer of dedication and reconsecration. Come quickly, come quickly. If you know you ought to be down here, come quickly. If you're in one of those groups, come quickly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand praise as they come. Hallelujah. Folks, did you hear that? What language is that? Spanish? French? Or perhaps African? No, this is gibberish, unknown tongue. Pagan unknown tongue, that is what it is. When the Bible said the apostles were speaking in unknown tongue, they were actually referring to known languages. The, the, the Arabians were listening to the, their language being spoken. The Greeks had their language being spoken. It was language understandable. Understandable. But this gibberish. Another occasion where he did it. Brothers, I've stopped by your camp meeting to let you know that though the winds and the storms of life may come upon you, the victory has already been won. The devil knows it and you ought to know it also. What's that? Folks, what's that? Gibberish. Pagan unknown language. Speaking in tongue, they call it. I believe that Adventist apostasy within our ranks has reached its heights, friends. It's about time that Jesus taps and causes shaking very soon. What's happening in the world is already crept into our church. These issues have, been, have to be dealt with. We have to do our with the Spirit of God. The later in Spirit of God is about to be poured out. And we are also seeing this false reformation, revival taking place. So that there will be a clear distinction between 
the false and the true revival. The true revival will be based upon the Bible. The false revival will be based upon emotion, feeling, shaking, shaking of your body, not the shaking of your heart. If you are shaken by your body, you will be rooted out from the truth. Folks, where is your inspiration coming from? From the Bible or for the moving of the flesh, from the music, from the uh, from the repetitive, uh, the way in which they preach, rhythm, following a certain rhythm that that hypnotizes the people, like Barry Black here doing his presentation. Folks, it's a Bible that sanctifies and unites the flock. What is causing unity amongst us? What message are we bringing to the world? This message has to first sanctify us. The more we go to the world, the more our head is being destroyed. They go to Babylon, mingle with Babylonians and the, 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 the leaders, Pope, the papacy, the spirit of pro the spirit of prophecy says it is a backsliding church that lessens the gap between itself and the papacy. If we are in that state, that shows that we are in a backsliding church. We are not advancing. We are in the church, militant fighting. But soon, those who pursue through with God's power, united in the truth, will be united in the church triumphant in the near future, where we will be reaping the benefits that is given through the power of the true revival of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth, the Bible calls it. This is not the spirit of truth. This is the spirit of the devil. Whatever is not of God is of the devil. Folks, think about it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's apostasy amongst our ranks. We pray for Barry Black. We pray for the people of Oakwood Conference that brought those Babylonians to sing for them. At the, at the impact conference. We pray for Ganon Dio. We pray that you may walk on their hearts. We are saying this with a painful heart, Father, that they may see and convert while time and probation lingers, because this is not of you. Bible is a principle in which we worship, reverence, solemnity, respect. That is what should be pervading our church service. And here it's not the spirit of God. It's not your spirit. It's another spirit. And Lord, while we bring this third angel's message forward, this solemn message, let us know how to reach them, how to reach them. And do not compromise without compromising. We should go where they are only to show you truth, not to be ministered, but go to minister so that we win souls not to rub shoulders with them and so that we are in harmony with them, even to tolerate the heresies. We can't do that, Father. We have to stand on the platform of truth. Help us to do just that. Father, be with us. Give us the strength, a little more strength, to push on because the close of probation is right upon us. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lighthouse Beams Ministry is an Adventist self-supportive ministry that is dedicated in spreading the truth of the Three Angels message. If you feel that what we are doing has touched your life and can touch the lives of the others, please do support us by either PayPal as a one-time payment or become a Patreon supporter simply by clicking their respective link in the description below. Make a decision today to be part of something amazing and life-changing and help spread the everlasting gospel while we still have this little window of opportunity. God bless you all.